for you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Let's thank the Lord of Peace. That was awesome. The kids are welcome to go downstairs at a fun time. Kids don't have to go downstairs. They're, they're always welcome to stay here. I did a year of work with um, teen ministry, so I'm used to distractions. And normally the adults cause more distractions than the kids in the <laughs> Than it's that. So in your bulletin, you'll notice a couple of scriptures. The second scripture we're going to get to this morning is 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 is where we're going to begin in Corinthians. First, we're going to be reading Luke 22. Luke 22, uh, verse 14. We're just going to read some from Luke 22. Um, so as you're turning there in your Bibles, um, we're just going to get into this uh, message here this morning. I didn't know how long I was going to have. Um, initially this morning, I knew we wanted to welcome a new family in the church. That's so important. Um, I wanted to have the ladies share with you what they experienced, the high grades. That's so important. And the ladies, again, thank you for doing that. It was awesome. Um, good stuff. So I didn't know how much time I was going to have left, but um, I, I don't want to rush through this. This is very important. And this morning, I want to talk about communion. So every so often, we, we talk about these certain things. Like last week, we had a whole message about um, church, what is a church, what is membership, why do I need to be a member, walk through the door once a part of the church family, why do I need to be a member, things like that. It's on YouTube now, it's on Facebook, if you missed it last week, go back and check it out. Um, we have many other um, different services here that we do. Some, some, some weeks we do like a traditional um, service, let's say like Christmas or Christmas Eve, right? We, we have special services for Christmas, Christmas Eve, Easter. Okay, those are special services. Nothing wrong with those. There's a lot of other days in the calendar. Um, we just did like a, a Memorial Day service where we had a message and stuff kind of geared a little bit towards Memorial Day. Next week is Father's Day. The week after that is graduation Sunday. So we, we have these extra special things. There's other ones too that, that come up. The Labor Day service. Sometimes we honor them. Sometimes veterans. Sometimes we do something special about Veterans Day. Um, we often celebrate these special seasons as well, like the Advent season, those four weeks leading up to Christmas. And sometimes we take a look at Lent. We don't really do a lot with Lent here in this church, but we do. Um, occasionally we do. We have other services and um, kind of traditional services, almost like rituals that we do here as well, things like wedding services. And, and um, we do uh, things like funerals, um, baby dedications. Okay, these are very important services, but we don't do them routinely. We don't do them traditionally. Um, all of these types of services that I just talked about, they're all nice and they're very valuable. And it's good that we um, take a day to set aside for these certain activities, but these aren't mandatory. Okay, they're biblical and it's, it's good that we look into these special weeks, but they're, they're not mandatory. We're not, we're not told you have to have a memorial day service. You, you don't have to do this or do that, okay? Um, that's not in the Bible. Um, we are American Baptists here. We don't talk a lot about our denomination. That's what we are. Very similar to some other denominations, Protestant denominations. Um, what we do look at here is there's two ordinances that we look at. Um, baptism and communion. Those are our two ordinances. Well, what are ordinances? Something a churchy word. Well, ordinance is just a command of God. Um, we're ordained to do these things. We're commanded to do these things. The Bible describes these two ordinances as being very important. That's why we do them. We're instructed to do these things, commanded to do them, baptism, communion. Now, we spoke very briefly last Sunday about baptism. We're going to be spending an entire Sunday on baptism sometime in August, and then we'll be going to the lake to actually do baptisms like, like we normally do. Um, but today we're going to take a look at the ordinance of communion. We're going to take a really dig into it a little bit in the time we have and learn more about communion. Um, communion is this act of worship. And that's where we're going to be going here in just a few minutes. So let's pray and we'll really um, dig into communion. Father, we just thank you so much for allowing us to all be here this morning. Father, I pray for each and every person who could be anywhere this morning, but somehow, for some reason, you drew us here. You have something that you want us to hear this morning. Father, I pray we don't just hear it, we listen to it. We make changes in our lives where need, where, where need be. We, we apply what we're, here, what we're hearing. We apply it to our lives right now. We don't wait. 
we're given today, we're not promised tomorrow. Father, if, if there's something that you would have one of us here, here this morning, I pray that we hear it and we make changes immediately in our lives. And Father, finally, allow me to speak accurately, clearly, the truth that laid on my heart to share with this family this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So communion, this is not something to be taken lightly. Sometimes you'll see I have communion set up and then we don't do the communion because I feel like we're not giving it to do. It's not something we're going to rush through ever. Okay, it, it's more important than that. Um, this is communion is not something to be taken lightly. Okay, we do not partake in communion um, on a regular basis, like a habit. Um, I know a lot of churches they'll do it like the first Sunday of the month. Or, and I'm not saying it's wrong. Do it whenever you feel led to do it. But a lot of churches do it very routinely, and and they'll look at you kind of funny. It's supposed to. Sunday of the month and we're not doing communion. No, we're not. But maybe next week we'll do it. We'll change things up a little bit. So this is not a tradition that we do like that. It's not a man-made thing we carry out. Okay, we try to look what the Bible says about communion and we try to do that. So I want us all to understand communion this morning is powerful. Okay, communion is not something that we just tack on to the end of a service. Um, so much more than that. We participate in communion. We partake in communion out of obedience to God. Okay, we're going to read about it here in a minute. We're instructed to do this. We also participate in communion out of worship back to God. This is an act of worship, and you'll understand that here in a few minutes. And it's a great opportunity for us to give thanks to the Lord. That's what communion is all about. Communion is this symbolic act of obedience. It's a symbolic act of remembrance. Remembering what Jesus did for us, what God did for us. Jesus sacrificed his son for us. Jesus sacrificed his life for us. God sacrificed his own son for us. Imagine that. And that's what we're remembering here this morning. Jesus himself teaches us about communion in the scripture that we're about to read. Jesus is going to give us these instructions on communion. Let's read it. Luke 22, 14. This is my go-to scripture. This, you can read this other places in the gospel, but I always read out of Luke. Whenever we do communion here, Luke 22, 14 begins this way. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this, <clears throat> I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Let's pause there. Okay, these are the words of Jesus. And he's demonstrating himself how important communion is. Okay? What did he just say? It's, it's a priority here. Okay, what did he just say? I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover meal with you. Okay, Jesus knew the plan. He knew what was about to happen that night. He knew what was unfolding. He knew this big plan that God had for him, but he eagerly desired to share this meal with us before the plan continued. First, I want to eat this meal with you. And then he says, I will not eat this meal again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying, I'll no longer, after tonight, I'll, after, after this event, I'll no longer be here to share this meal with you. But I'll be back. And until I come back, I want you to do this. And remember to me, I want you to continue to do this. And think about me when you do it. Verse 17, let's read it. After taking the cup, he gave thanks. And Jesus said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Let's pause there again. So Jesus picks up the cup, right? What does the scripture say? The cup contained the fruit of the vine. And Jesus gave thanks to God for the fruit of the vine in the cup. The Greek word for this is oinos, which, which means grape juice, unfermented grape juice, new wine. And that represents the new spirit in the heart of a believer. The innermost being. So Jesus says, take this cup. Take what I'm offering you. Divide it among you. Spread it around. Let everyone have some of what I have to offer. It's not just for you. It's for everyone. Spread it around. Pass it around. He says, I'm not going to be able to do this for a while with you. But you can. Go and do this. Share what I'm about to share with you. Until I come back. Then verse 19 says this, And Jesus took the bread, and he gave thanks and broke it. He gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pause again. So now Jesus takes the bread. It would have been 
unleavened bread. You read about it, it would have been unleavened bread because Passover was a Jewish celebration. The Jewish people would not be eating yeast during Passover. That's what, where you get the unleavened bread. Unleavened bread does not have yeast in it. The Jewish people would not add yeast to their food during Passover. So the unleavened bread, you would also have unleavened wine. You would not have the yeast to ferment the wine for Passover. So it's the fruit of the vine, grape juice. Jesus took it, he gave thanks, broke the bread, gave it to them. Jesus is basically saying this. He's saying, this is my body. Okay, this is a symbol, right? Jesus is still standing here. He's sitting there with them. He says, this is my body given to you. This is my sacrifice. I'm going to lay down my body for you. This is it. I'm laying it down for you. This is a symbol of it. Every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Remember that this bread, this is my body. Every time you do it, remember it. I sacrifice this for you. I lay down my body for you. And as I was reading this, I, I started thinking about this. Think about <clears throat> where, where do you put a sacrifice normally? All through history, you can read about it in the Bible. The Bible is pretty clear on what to do with a sacrifice. But you can look at anything. You can look at Greek mythology. You can look at history. You can look at um, history books outside of the Bible. Every time there's a, a sacrifice, where is it laid? On the altar. You always lay your sacrifice on the altar. On this sacrificial table. And that is actually what altar means. Holy table. The table set apart from all other tables. For God's use. The altar or table would hold this sacrifice. When you look at the Bible. Abraham built an altar. Jacob and Joshua and Moses. Isaac all built an altar. Where they would lay sacrifices. We use a communion table. An altar. Upon which we lay the sacrifice, the symbolic act, sacrifice that the bread and the cup, the body and the blood of Jesus. Of course, they symbolize today just as they did when Jesus was passing them around to his disciples. Symbolize the body, symbolize the blood. Some call this a communion table or the Lord's table. I refer to it a lot as the Lord's table. Some call it a remembrance table. Some call it an altar. It doesn't matter what we call it. It's where we come and gather and remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And often on this table, as you can see in front of us here this morning, often on this table you're going to find God's Word, the Bible. And it's their life because that's our anchor. That's our rock. That's what we're building our everything on, that Bible, God's Word. We believe every word in there is God breathed. It's God's Word. That's why it's there. We read it. We build our lives upon it. We study it. We allow it to change us. It's on the table. We want to remember it. All of it. You got to read it to remember it. In this morning's daily Bible study, <clears throat> there's a, a small scripture that, that just says, remember how amazing God is. Remember the miracles. Remember what he did. And it's so in line. I had no idea that's going to come up this morning on the day that we do communion. We talked about this the last few weeks as well as remember you can't remember something if you haven't experienced it yet. Okay, so you've got to be in the Word. You've got to be praying. You've got to learn what that Bible on that offering table says so we can remember it. What else is on the table? There's some candles. Normally there's one candle, two candles. That represents the Holy Spirit. When you accept Jesus Christ, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will come in and reside in the heart of the believer. So the candles are here just to remind us of the Holy Spirit. And then there's offering plates on the table. The offering plates are where we can lay our personal sacrifices to God. This is where we can lay down some of what we have given. It's all God's. This is where we can make a sacrifice and say, you know what, instead of like this five-hour coffee, instead of doing this or that, I'm going to give some back to God. This is His. That's why the offering plates are there. It's an offering. It's a sacrifice that we're making, given back. And then verse 20 says this. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let's pause again. Here again, Jesus is referring to his own blood being shed for you willingly. He's pouring it out. No one's taking it from him. Okay, he's making this sacrifice. He's choosing to, to follow God's plan. He's laying down his life for you and me. Laying it on the altar. <clears throat> so I'm doing this for you. His blood's being poured out for you, not taken. He desires 
to make this sacrifice for you. And that's the new covenant that his blood will cover your sins. Our side of the deal is to believe what he did for us. Believe that. Believe what he did for us. Verse 21. But the, <clears throat> this is important. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. This is Jesus speaking again. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will find us as, as it has been decreed. But woe to the man that betrays him. Let's pause there. We know here that through scripture, the person that was sitting around the table to pass over a meal with Jesus, we know is Judas. Okay? We know from surrounding scripture that it's Judas who was going to betray Jesus. Judas was dipping his hand into the bowl of oil, dipping his bread into that oil and eating it with Jesus. Jesus knew it. Jesus knew Judas was going to betray him. Jesus knew that Judas was about to hand him over to the guards. He knew it. Jesus says, woe to the man who betrays me. This is so important. I always say here before communion, I always say this is not my table, it's the Lord's table. I always say everyone that's here is welcome to um, partake in communion, and that goes for today. But, you got to hear the rest. And you'll understand why I say that in a minute. Communion is personal. Communion is between you and God. It's not between you and me and God. It's between you and God. I'm not in the middle of it. This church is not in the middle of it. This church board is not in the middle of it. They can't make a decision for you to remember what Jesus did for you. That's between you and God. You're supposed to remember what Jesus did for you. Remember the sins that he washed away from you. I don't know your whole story. I might not even know any of your story. You're supposed to remember the sins that he removed from you. You're supposed to think about the grace and the mercy that he extended to you. That he still is extending to us. And we've got to understand that when you accept Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, yeah, the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to clean you from the inside out. That doesn't give us a green light to continue sin. Right? We're supposed to become more and more Christ-like. We will, will we still sin? Absolutely. Every day. We'll think bad thoughts. We'll be angry, we'll be greedy, we'll do much other things as well. But we're struggling with those things, we're working on them, we're training not to do them, we're becoming more and more Christ-like. Jesus will cover that. But when you choose to say, God, I read that, I'm going to do it anyway. I feel like doing it. I like to do it. It's a whole different thing. So when we come to communion, we need to understand that it's the same grace that's available to all of us. It's the same love. It's the same mercy that's available to all of us, each and every one of us. It's the same offer to every one of us. But it means something different because we're all accepting it from a different place. We all come to Jesus at a different place. We talked, this, we talked about this last week. The body of Christ is made up of a bunch of people from all different roads, all different beliefs, all different backgrounds. Okay? But we all join together as the body. We all get here. We all say, yep, I want Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I believe he died for me. He's going to clean you from the inside out. He's, he's changing me. You, you guys know how he's changing you for you. I can't judge that. That's the one thing we cannot judge is your relationship with Jesus. We can help correct other, you know, in other areas. That's the one thing we cannot judge. Somebody's belief and faith in Jesus. Somebody's salvation. Because we don't really know it. I can listen to your lips. I can hear your words. I can see you get on your knees and, and pray or whatever. I don't know what your heart really is saying. Look at Judas. Judas put on a pretty good show. But you know who knew? Jesus. Jesus knew. God knows. And that's where we're going here. When, when we come and take communion, woe to the person who betrays me. As Christians, as believers, we should all be on the same path now. Once you, we're from all different backgrounds, all different places, but once we gather here, now we're following Jesus, right? He said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's what he says. Follow me. That's what he says. Feed my children. Follow him. Do what he does. Say what he says. Go where he goes. That's what he wants us to do. 
in this verse, verse 22, Jesus is warning us, this is not a game. Okay, taking communion is just not some game. You just don't, oh, this is the first Sunday of the month. I'm going to come here and get a checkbox for taking communion. That's not what it is. So much more than that. you got to truly turn from your old ways. you got to come clean. you got to truly repent. Repent is a, one of these churchy words, but it's so true. That repent is a verb. It's an action. You don't just say you're going to do something. You do it. You stop doing this. You, you stop going there. You choose to turn away from the road that you're running full speed down, and you turn to Jesus. Jesus is asking us to do that. Turn to me. Turn away from your sins, wherever they are. I'll, I'll clean them. I'll take care of that. That's why I died. I choose to lay down my life for you. Turn away from that stuff. Turn to me. Accept me as your Lord and Savior. When you choose to believe in me, when you choose to follow me, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. Welcome to my family. Do this in remembrance of me. That's what Jesus is saying. But he also says, woes to the person who's lying. Woes to the person who's faking it. Woes to the person that's just giving a lip service. Woes to the person who's betraying me. I don't know where you stand with Jesus. You do. That's why I say this is the Lord's table. I don't know where you are in your relationship. Sometimes people look really rough on the outside. And sometimes they have the most powerful relationship with Jesus. That we might not even understand. We can't judge people. God sees their hearts. We only see faces. Everyone's welcome to come to his table and remember what he did for them. It's up to you. Paul takes us another step. Paul speaks about communion. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Paul's again speaking to this young church in Corinth. Paul is speaking to young Christians. And Paul says this in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul goes on in verse 25. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul continues, verse 26. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pause there for a minute. So Paul basically retells that whole Last Supper story, right? He, he basically just said the same thing that Luke said. He says, remember Jesus. Remember Jesus' words. Remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Proclaim the good news until he comes back. Paul is simply reinforcing the words of Jesus. And then Paul continues. Paul continues with a very similar warning that, that Jesus gave us. Verse 27, so then, Paul continues here, so then, whoever eats the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Getting a little uncomfortable. Verse 28, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That's pretty powerful. You don't take this lightly. You don't just eat a piece of bread and, and knock down a, a little drink and think that you're clean now, and think that you're all set. No. Way much more than that. Paul is saying here, Paul's expanding on what Jesus said. Jesus said, woes to those, woes to those who betray me. And now Paul is saying, do this, but do it in a worthy manner. He's saying, it's not a ritual, not a game, not a box to be checked. What did Paul say? You are to examine yourself. Examine yourself before you take part in communion. What does that mean? Look at yourself. Are you betraying Jesus? Oh, I'm not betraying Jesus. I love Jesus. That's your words. That's your actions. Are you betraying Jesus with your actions? Okay? We talk about priorities last week. We talked about um, how devoted you are, things like that. Is he 19th? Is God and Jesus and Bible and prayer, is that like 19th on your priority list? Okay, that's what you're getting back to here. Okay, are you devoted to him? Are you devoted to reading and praying? Are you devoted to thanking God for all we have in our lives? Are you devoted to worshiping him every single day when you get up, when you lay down, when you sleep? 
Are you devoted to it? Are you devoted to coming here on Sunday mornings and worshiping the Lord? Are you devoted to turning from sin, turning from your old way and turning to Christ? Are you devoted to it? That's examining yourself, asking yourself those questions that we ended last week's message with. Examine yourself. Are you training how to overcome those sins in your life? Well, how do I do that? you got to be in the Word. Okay? you got to come be around other believers. Just let us sharpen each other. Let us help each other. Let us push each other forward. Let us say, you know, this thing you're doing, you probably shouldn't really be doing that. I used to do that. This is how I got away. We're here to help each other. Not to point fingers and criticize. We're here to help and love. Because there's something better out there. You know what the consequences that sin will bring? Sins are forgiven. Consequences can go on for generations. My consequences can affect those around me. Your consequences affect those around you. Examine yourself. Are you betraying him with your words? Are you betraying him with your actions? Do you say, I, I love you, I choose you, but then you also choose the world. You, you choose your feelings, you choose your desires. And Paul ends by saying, be real with God, be real with yourself. Examine yourself. How do you do that? You, you pray to God, you speak to God, you come clean with Him. You press your life up against His Word. When you read something in the Bible, use that as a mirror to reflect your life back. You press it up against there. If, if you press your life up against this Word, and you're not seeing Christ come back, if you're seeing the world come back, you might have to make some changes. You might think, I've done this my whole life. I've got away with it. It's been fine. Look at me. Look at me go. I'm a big boy, a big girl. I can do it. If the Bible says don't do it, don't do it. There's reasons for it. You might not even understand right now. You will someday. I guarantee you every Christian that's in here that's been walking with Christ for a while, a week, or ten years, I can pass them life around and they can share a story with how Christ has, has cleaned them and changed their lives. They're not where they used to be, thank God. Verse 30, Paul continues, and we're almost done. This is Paul still speaking. That is why many among you are weak and sick. Why? Because you're not examining yourself. Okay? You're not using God's word to reflect. You, I know a lot of people that take God's word and they push it on somebody else. You should do this. You should do No, no, no. Read God's word. It's about you. Examine yourself. Stop pointing the finger. Examine yourself is what Paul is saying. That's what God's word is saying. Why? That is why many, of, many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. Because they're not examining themselves. They're not reflecting. They're not following Jesus. Let's continue. Verse 31. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. We wouldn't be weak and sick, lost and hurting. Verse 32. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned in the world. Powerful stuff. Let's pause again. Paul is saying, this is the reason that many folks are sick and weak and lost and feel hurt and feel abandoned and feel like, I've been a Christian, but I don't feel any different. I've been a Christian for years. I don't feel any different. I feel like I'm alone here. When's the last time you examined yourself? When's the last time you really took a good examination, reflected your life off of God's Word? There could be a whole bunch of stuff in there, 18, 19 things that you're putting ahead of Christ. He's saying, examine yourself. Are you betraying me in any one of these areas? Don't do it. Woe's to you. This is why so many people are in pain and suffering and experiencing the consequences of poor decisions, unholy choices. This is why so many people have fallen asleep. Here's something about falling asleep. It's about being comfortable in your sin. We just sit down. Oh, I know all this stuff. I'm just here. I'm going to take communion this morning. I'll be good for the next month. Get my check mark. I've done this for so many years, I'm just good, tired, comfortable. I know what God says about these things over here, but geez, look at I got 90 things going on really good over here. These couple things over here, God, I'll, Jesus died for those, right? He'll, he'll cover that stuff. I can continue to walk down those roads. Woe to the person who betrays me. Start pressing your life up against the word. It's all about a heart. Your heart. It's all about your attitude. It's all about your relationship with Jesus. Not your relationship through me or through your parents or through anyone else. It's about your relationship with Jesus. 
Paul says, no. Paul says, if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, don't worry about other people. If you're more discerning in regards to yourself, you would not be under such judgment. Press your life up against God's word. That's the standard by which we should be living. Don't judge yourself by what other people are telling you or who you are, what you are, where you've been, if you're unworthy. Don't listen to that stuff. It doesn't matter what other people say. This is what matters, what God says. You're wonderfully, fearfully made. I love you. i got a plan and a purpose for your life, no matter where you've been, no matter what you're into. I love you. I want you back. Stop playing games with me. I want you to come here. I want you to experience me. I want you to examine yourself. Be real. You gotta examine yourself. Ask, how am I doing? Am I walking in the spirit or am I walking in the world? Am I walking in the spirit or am I walking in my feelings and desires? Am I reflecting the world? When I press my life up against God's word, am I reflecting Jesus to the world or am I reflecting the world to the world? Do they see anything different in me? We're supposed to be different, new creation in Christ. Little by little, he's cleaning us, changing us. We're different, we're set apart. Elijah and I went up to Wani Kina. People knew we were a little different by the time we left. That's how it should be. You don't want to just come in. Paul says, be all things, all people, so some might be saved. You don't walk in and just become 100% like them. You can go in there and you can hang out with people. You can relate to them, but you don't become them. We're becoming Christ, something different. All right. Verse 33, Paul's almost done here. Paul's saying, um, do this now. Examine yourself now so you don't have the consequences, right? He's saying, if you examine yourself now, make these changes in your life now, not because other people want you to, because God wants you to, and you want you to. You gotta want to do it. Between you and God, Paul's saying, discipline is good now. Okay, if he's putting you through something now, if he's opening your eyes now, it's good to do it now. We're given today, not promised tomorrow. Okay, I would rather be disciplined now, temporarily, where I'm learning and growing than to be disciplined for the rest of my life, for, for all of eternity. Verse 33, so then my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. And that's what we're gonna do here in just a minute. We're going to partake in communion. Again, it's open to everyone. Everyone is welcome to the Lord's table here. It's not my table. Everyone is welcome to partake in communion this morning. We're going to be passing it out here in just a minute. First time we haven't used a little pre-made cups in a while. It's good that we can get back to our normal, more of a normal procedure. But remember, this is not a ritual. This is not something that we just do flippantly. This is not something we do out of tradition because we have to. It's something we want to do. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. So right now, I want us all just to take a minute or two you don't have to take communion, it's up to you. When they pass it out, you don't have to take it if you don't want. You can take it and not partake, not, not eat it or drink it. It's up to you. Okay. I put no stipulation on this. Jesus passed it out amongst his followers. And he, he said, every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Woe is to the one who betrays me. And Paul adds to that, um, expands on it. And he says, examine yourself before you do it. Just, just understand why you're doing this. Because I died for those sins that you're living for, possibly. I died for the sins that you used to participate in, that you used to love, that you used to think were okay. I died for them, is what Jesus is saying. He says, remember me when you do this. Remember what I did for you. Remember I died for you. And again, that's not a green light to say, well, if he died for that, I can continue to do it. And he'll just clean me again. That's not, what, that's not what he's saying at all. If you'll love the Lord. You'll devote yourself to the Lord and you'll become more Christ-like day by day. So let's take a few minutes examine yourself. I don't know where you are. You do. I can hear what you say to me. The world can see your actions. Some of them. Come clean with the glory now. Examine yourself. He knows. He knows already. Just, just pray. Just ask him to help you right now. I'm just going to let us have a couple minutes of silent prayer and then we're going to continue. Yeah. 
this one created, we all want to become more like him. May we all see and understand the sacrifice that you made for us. God, you sent your son to die for us. Jesus, you laid down your life for us, willingly, eagerly. Father, we thank you for that. Father, no matter where, where we've been in our lives, no matter what dirt, no matter what we've come out of, no matter what name tag we think we wear, we know that we, when we believe and when we accept Jesus, we wear the name tag as a Christian son and daughter of God. Father, we thank you for that. Father, I pray that we all examine ourselves right now. Where is it that we need your help? Where is it we need your guidance? Help us. And Father, if we're still resisting in an area, if we're still thinking, yeah, I'm examining myself, but I like doing that. I desire to do that. I choose it. Father, I pray that we understand how serious these choices are. Father, we thank you that we can turn, we turn back to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. If uh, Daniel Lee, if you guys want to come forward right now, I'm just going to read this again, then we're going to pass out the elements. This is Luke 22, 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks. Jesus said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes.